Greetings, fellow planeswalkers. I'm James. And I'm Paul. And you're listening to the newest episode of the Commander at Arms podcast. This week on the podcast, we're talking about the mechanics and keywords from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty and our first impressions of them. But before we do any of that, we have our upkeep trigger to do, and we want to thank all of our patrons for keeping the lights on here, keeping us fed. If you want to help support the show, you can do that through patreon.com slash commander at arms. There are three tiers in there, possibly maybe even going to get a fourth one, who knows? Uh, and every tier gets access to our Discord server where you get to play Magic with us. Uh, after that, we have Mail Day and Interesting Finds. Paul, have you found or bought anything spicy? No spending for me. I've uh, had a couple of birthdays and Christmases recently, so I actually i have been trying to keep the money spending a little low. Um, so nothing, no, no finds, no purchases for me. Uh, still waiting on my Stranger Things to come in so I can finally put that Max and Lucas deck together. Yes. Did you say you've been having birthdays and Christmases in January? Uh, yeah. January and uh, December are kind of packed for me, honestly. But you only have one Christmas in that, right? Or do you get multiple Christmases? Christmas is a big holiday, right? Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll, I'll give you that one. We don't need to go into my family's version of how Christmas works back in Australia. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah, cool. I actually have, I've bought some stuff recently. Um, I think the last time we talked about this, this, this stuff, I, I had found some interesting stuff in, uh, an old box in a cupboard that is in the top of my recording studio. Um, and that was some really cool, cool shenanigans. Um, my nan, my lovely nan actually sent me some money for my birthday and Christmas for last year, as well as a congratulations on getting married present. Uh, so I took some of that cash and I bought myself a carpet of flowers from oh, like an OG printing carpet of flowers from Urza's Saga. So that one came in literally today, like an hour before we started recording. I went, got home from the gym checked the letterbox, opened it up, saw the letter there, came, rushed rushed back to the apartment, uh, opened it up, and then slipped it straight into Tulane. Yeah. James, uh, it was the first thing he showed me. Like, he was more proud of the carpet of flowers than he was of the, you know, 60, 70 pounds he's lost. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 66 <laughs> now. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty banging, not going to lie. I love it. Anyway, that is a whole discussion we can have on Discord if you guys join the Patreon. Haha, <laughs> there we go. We can talk about weight loss if you want to. Um, after that, we have our uh, we have our deck tech of the week. This was a couple of days ago now, actually. I think this is the second time we've, we've been able to promote this one on the podcast. It is the Mariner deck tech. It is mono black uh, rats combo deck that isn't our deck. It is a uh, it is a fan of the show and a friend of the show's. Uh, it's Jared from our Discord server. He brewed the deck. Uh, we put it together. I gave it to, I gave it an architect treatment and I teched it for the show. So go check it out on youtube.com slash commander at arms. Uh, we are so close to hitting 200 subscribers. Yes. I know that's quite small compared to other content creators, but for us, it is a huge milestone. Uh, I did put out a tweet the other day, yesterday, actually about trying to get to 200. That gave us about an extra 15 because we were at 175 for about a two weeks or so. So if you, uh, if you listen to this and you're not subscribed, please, please subscribe. If you're watching on the YouTubes this episode, uh, please don't forget to like, comment, uh, subscribe, and hit the bell for the notification so you never miss a video from us because we're going to be putting out a lot more or um, video content than we will be audio content because we are actually streaming and we would have already streamed after this episode airs. So if you haven't checked it, if you didn't check out our stream from yesterday, uh, go and you can check out our next stream, which we will start promoting, uh, in a couple of days after this record, after we've done this recording, I should say after this airs, um, but we got to play with, uh, with Corey and Jason from ones from commander crew. So Corey from the commander crew and Jason from, from commander hub, we got to play some games with them. Uh, yeah, if you didn't check it out, you know, it's cool. The VOD will be up. You can check that out on a YouTube channel. And then the week after that, so next week, we'll have uh, some two amazing new guests on the show as well. Uh, so if you want to check those ones out, you can do it at twitch.tv slash commander at arms. Again, all links will be in the show notes slash description below. Just get our name out there. Do everything you can to push as much commander, commander at arms content out to your friends. Um, after that, Paul, we have play of the week. 
Have you done anything interesting, spicy, and or intimidating in any commander game? Uh, unfortunately, not really. I um, I kind of had to quarantine a little bit due to due to due to a potential uh, exposure to a certain virus. Um, everybody's fine though. Don't worry. Me and my family are fine. Um, but yeah, I didn't I didn't play Magic. I didn't really go out at all because of that. So no player of the week for me this week. I'm sorry, everybody. I have a spicy one. I got to play Magic on the Discord server uh, Friday night. We do our uh, our Friday night EDH nights on the Discord server, which I just said. Uh, and I convinced my wife to play with us. So I played Yarrick. She played Timner and Vile Smasher. There was a group hug uh, Ramos deck. And there was also a AAC of Gaia Straits Landfall Precon that has very, very slight upgrades because that's kind of where he wants it to be. And uh, I did find this really funny, interesting loop with Yarrick. That is Tima Sabretooth, Coiling Oracle, Tiles Provisioner, and Lotus Cobra with Yarrick on the field. And then also a Thassa, because why not? So you're able to like tap, uh, you know, tap to bounce the Coiling Oracle back to your hand. Cast the Coiling Oracle, reveal the top card. If it's a land, it comes into play. You get two floating mana as well as two treasures. That pays for you to be able to do it again. Uh, if it's an, a non-land, you draw it into your hand and you can kind of just keep going through. It's not infinite or anything. It was just straight value. Uh, I think I did it like six or seven times in one turn. And then my last one was, all right, I'll just flicker something else with faster because they don't want to keep drawing cards and making treasures uh yeah a lot of fun um people definitely thought i was a threat after that and uh i died first because of that and it was all fun i loved it it was so good honestly if i was playing against that i would actually like i would actually want it to be infinite because since it's technically not infinite you actually have to go through the whole process of revealing the top card and putting on the battlefield yes but it's me i was quite quick with it because i've played that deck quite some time so it was like all right, crack two, activate Tima, bounce Coiling Oracle. Okay, use my floating two to, you know, cast Oracle, uh, Coiling Oracle, reveal top card. It's a land card. It comes into play. Here's my treasure. Here's my two floating. Uh, here's my green and blue floating. All right, cool. The next one is uh, whatever it is. Pull it in my hand or put it on the battlefield. Here's my two treasures and my floating green and my floating blue. So, I mean, at, after like the third loop of it, everyone kind of knew what colors I was floating with the Lotus Cobra and that I make two treasures and... It kind of got nutty after I started adding in. I added Kadama of the East Tree into it because that's just <laughs> fun. Because why not? So every time I got a, a a treasure, I was able to drop another land if I hadn't land in my hand. Uh, yeah, quite quite nutty. I did dive first very quickly after that, so it it's it's cool. It didn't get out of hand. I didn't win. It, it wasn't this immaculate combo that was going to like you know generate infinite mana or anything. It was just this cool little synergy that I didn't even think about when I put the deck together. And that deck is still surprising me about what I can and can't do with some of the creatures that are in there. It's true. Me and James actually came up with uh, a, a, not really a new combo, but one that he didn't know that he had in the deck. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, like, I, I forgot what the cards were. I think it was uh, Mana War and Peregrine Drake. Correct. With Yarak out. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, that one uh, makes infinite mana and infinite storm count. Yeah. He was like, huh, I played both those cards in there. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is if I have the, you know, the seven mana, I can, uh, you know, with Yarrick out, cast Rune Scar Demon, go get those two creatures next turn, make infinite mana. All right, cool. I've got infinite mana. Uh, after I've got infinite mana, I can then bounce the Man of War and the Rune Scar Demon back to my hand. I can cast the Rune Scar Demon, go search for two more cards, put those into my hand, keep going off. And from there, it's just this chain reaction of, getting to search my library for two of the best cards every single time to a form some combo and win the game. Woot, yeah, woot. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, just casual mid battle cruiser things. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With all of that said and done, Paul, let's move into our main phase one here. We're going to start breaking down the mechanics of Kamigawa neon dynasty. We have four brand new mechanics, two of them new, two of them returning uh, let's start off with a brand new one. It's called Reconfigure. Do you want to kind of explain this to our listeners? Yeah, Reconfigure is actually, for those of you who play Modern or are familiar with older cards, uh, it's a form of the attach mechanic that was in, I think, like New Phyrexia um, with like cranial plating where you could pay a mana cost and instant speed attach it. Uh, this one is unfortunately not instant speed. 
Uh, but it basically think of Transformers. You pay a cost, and the artifact equipment creature turns into just an equipment that you slap onto a creature. So it's kind of like a separate form of equipping it. Um, any creature, anything that has reconfigure, currently speaking at least, uh, is an artifact creature equipment that loses the creature subtype when you reconfigure it to equip it to a creature. Um, so it works similarly to equip, especially since it's sorcerer speed, except it loses its creature type. And that's all really. Yeah, I really, really like this mechanic. Uh, so you can essentially equip it or sorry, you can reconfigure it onto a creature, attack with that creature, and then main phase two, uh, as long as the creature didn't take lethal damage and it wasn't giving it a buff or anything to its toughness, you can uh, reconfigure it off again to then have a blocker for the next turn, which I think is really cool. And I was having a talk uh, in Discord with some people about this as well, uh, mainly one of them being Corey from the Commander Crew. And I was talking about how I wanted this to really be like a pirate-themed mechanic. I was like, man, if this could have been like pirate-themed, maybe call it companion, and you can kind of like, you know, you get like, say like, Ragavan, for for instance, but you could have you could re you could reconfigure or I guess equip Ragavan to a creature, to another legendary pirate or another legendary creature or non legendary creature or whatever, and then be able to take it off kind of thing because like it kind of goes with that theme of you know pirates always having companions around and sitting on their shoulders. We'd get like birds that could do it as well and monkeys and I don't know maybe a sea turtle. I don't know where I'm going with that one. Uh, I don't really know what else kind of sits on a pirate's shoulder, but I think it was a, re- it's a really, really cool mechanic. I actually really enjoy it. Uh, you could have like a sea turtle that turns into a blunderbuss. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm reaching a little bit there, but yeah, whatever. it's like Megatron <laughs> turning into a, into a gun from a robot. <laughs> that was more of a morph than anything else. Um, but reconfigure provides some interesting dual usage because they're creatures so you can reanimate them the same way you would a creature um but they also have synergies with equipment and in particular i'm actually kind of curious how these interact with uh what is it armory automaton yeah like do you get to just steal everybody's reconfigure creatures and slap them onto your automaton depends on exactly how automaton is worded it depends on how reconfigure is worded actually also that too because <laughs> it just does say that it loses the creature subtype right uh reconfigure attached to target creature you control or unattached from a creature while attached this isn't a creature so i think you actually just get to steal them and slap them on that's that's nutty oh that means i can do it with thieving skydiver yeah and yeah, then you, you can. can but then if you pay the 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 reconfigure cost because it goes back to your opponent then right because it's no longer a creature that you it's it, it's not under your control anymore uh with skeeving with thieving skydiver you actually gain control of it so it would be your creature delicious uh with the automaton it would go back to their to the opponent because it's now no longer an equipment hot spicy tech straight from the commander at arms studio i <laughs> love it because i play thieving skydiver in a lot of my decks and if i can steal people's like is it what is it simian sling and get to sling some some monkey stuff at people I'm going to do that as much as possible now. That is my that, that is my goal of 2022, is to have someone playing Simeon Sling, and I get to steal it with Thieving Skydiver, to then have a Skydiver monkey pet. Oh, I love I'm this. just looking forward to playing some of these reconfigure uh, little dudes in Alesha. Yeah, because they're counted as creatures in the graveyard, so you can reanimate them with, with Alesha. Mm-hmm. I love Especially that. Especially Lion Sash. Lion Sash is going to feel real good. So what you're saying is that we need to have a brew sesh where we update all of your decks again. That'll take a long time. That's all right. I'm here for it. That, that's what I'm here <laughs> for. Um, do you want to move on to the next mechanic? It is a returning one. If you have anything else you want to say about re, uh, reconfigure? Uh, no, not at all. Good. Cool. So the next returning mechanic, uh, usually we only saw on spirits when it first got printed. And now it's on a various different amount of permanents and colors. So this one is Channel. Paul, did you want to explain Channel to our listeners? Yeah. Channel is an activated ability of a card in your hand uh, where you pay a mana cost, you discard that card, and something happens. The ability depends on the card. But in general, you pay a mana cost, you discard the card, and do a thing. Um, 
just as an example of this, the one of the cooler ones I've seen so far is actually Greater Tanuki. Yes. Uh, which is a four and two green for a six five with trample. Honestly, pretty good already. Like if you're just trying to play a big old dumb thing. Uh, but you can pay two and a green and discard it, and you get to rampant growth. Basically, you search for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tap, and then shuffle. Uh, that is instant speed as well, which is pretty cool. You don't typically find ramp at instant speed, uh, at least not currently. Uh, and I'm looking forward. I'm really glad that channel isn't just for spirits because that would have made it like almost unplayable. I think. Um, I'm really glad that they're giving channel a more of a widely more more of a, more like wider applications that's what i was trying to say do you think that if there was a spirit out there that had the channel ability from greater tanuki on it would that be played in most white decks without green would that just become like premier like uh instant speed white ramp yeah of course that's what i thought All right, <laughs> absolutely uh by I mean, the way that- i think I think uh, I think channel right now is never mind. I'm, I'm wrong. I was gonna say it's limited to just enchantments, but I'm literally looking at an artifact that has it. So, lol. Great, it's Anuki is also a creature. Yeah, this it's an a non-artifact creature. creature. Yeah, channel. What a what a cool mechanic. I love that it's coming back. Uh, not something that we have seen since original Kamigawa, correct? Yeah, uh, literally not since then. And. Now the abilities aren't like just targeting spirits, you know, like I just listed one that was ramp. Um, There's one here that's actually just removal. One of the more popular ones is the green land that they spoiled or the, uh, was it Baseju? Baseju. Yeah. Yeah, That one's getting a lot of buzz and for good reason. That one is pretty ridiculous. Uh, Oh yeah. (laughs) <laughs> there are some really uh, cool cards in this set and I, so far from what I've seen of this set, I'm really, really enjoying it. I kind of went in a little just half mast about it. I was like, eh, it's, it's ninjas, it's samurais. That's usually what gets me like going. Like I love ninjas and samurais. Don't get me wrong. I love Japanese themed everything, but the fact that it was like neon and like cyborgs kind of threw me off a little bit. Uh, but nah, so far everything I'm seeing of this set, I'm loving. Yeah, ch- um, channel is going to be, I think, actually pretty popular in Commander now. Because uh, honestly, I haven't seen a single channel card that isn't theoretically playable. Yeah, and we haven't even seen the whole set yet. We're still going through preview seasons now, so who knows? Who knows what yeah. the next channel card's going to be? Oh, something I, f- I forgot to mention this. Something important to note about channel. Uh, even though the ability uses the stack, it's not a spell that you're casting. So it has to be stifled in some way, like counter target activated ability, or that's it, really. Um, yeah, you can you can either stifle it or you can uh, whirlwind denial it as well, because that gets rid of all all opponents' abilities on the stack. Uh, that works as well, or you can exile abilities through various ways. Uh, so but it's removal. still they're very difficult to interact with uh, abilities. Uh, so even the seemingly like innocuous ones. Uh, like owner of target non-land permanent puts it on top or the bottom of their library, uh, those suddenly become very valuable because they're instant speed, difficult to interact with. So for that blue player that's holding up all their counter spells and stuff, if they don't have exactly like a disallow or a stifle or something like that, then sorry, bud, you're SOL. <laughs> just like play it on, on the, on, they're just like, oh, you got, you got counter spell magic up? And they're like, yeah, of course I do. He's like, psych! Here, take this ability that you can't counter. <laughs> Just like lean over, like throw it in their face and be like, psych. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's move on to the next one here, Paul. And it is a mechanic we knew was coming back in this set because, I mean, it was, I believe, introduced in this set originally. Uh, and that is Ninjitsu. Love this mechanic. Love seeing Yuriko decks at the table. They just... They're so strong. They're so powerful. Insert generic Yuriko meme here. Excellent. Now that we're past that. Uh, Ninjitsu is a cool... It's actually a pretty cool mechanic. I do like Ninjitsu, and I love how flavorful it is. And Paul, you know the deal. Uh, Ninjutsu, very much like Channel, is an activated ability of a card in your hand. Generally ninjas. uh, But there are other ways for other cards to get ninjutsu you know i'm sure everybody's seen the spoilers for this set um uh you pay the cost and you return an unblocked attacking creature to your hand 
and you put that creature with ninjutsu in its place, basically. So you put it into the battlefield, tap them attacking. Um, there are various uses for this. It could be a way to sneak in like a few extra points of damage. Some creatures have abilities that happen when they deal damage, so you can uh, guarantee, basically, that you get ninjutsu by like swinging an unblockable creature and then ninjutsuing that out for the creature that you want the effect from. Uh, lots of cool things you can do with ninjutsu, and this set is no exception. You can ninjutsu in, I think there's like a 5-2 ninja. It's a, just a vanilla. Um, we're all pretty familiar with ninjutsu by this point with Yuriko, except Yuriko can do it with the command zone as well. Not the case here. This is just from your hand. And yeah, ninjutsu is like honestly kind of a one of the more popular mechanics from original Kamigawa. Uh, it leads to some weird timing things with combat that newer players generally might not entirely understand their first time dealing with it. Like, there is a time after de damage is dealt that your creature is still attacking. So you could, like, have your creature deal the damage and then ninjutsu the creature back out, I think, because it works like reconnaissance. I don't know. Yeah, uh, and then you, if you have the mana in your main two, you can then cast the unblock, unblocked creature again if you wanted an extra block off for the next turn. Yeah, it's 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 a peculiar phenomenon. Um, you can also ninjutsu more than once on the same creature. Um, that seldom ever comes into play, but with the new legendary uh, ninja that they spoiled, that gives your other creatures in your hand ninjutsu. It's somewhat relevant. Yeah, you can have one creature tapped and attacking that is unblocked and then ninjutsu on top of that card three or four different times. Yeah, um, really weird stuff. Uh, if if anybody needs... like, uh, Just ask the... like, If somebody tries to do some weird stuff with ninjutsu with you, just ask them to clarify what they're doing if you're in a scenario where you don't understand, honestly. Yeah, just raise your hand and ask for a judge. Someone will come over and give you a hand. <laughs> or uh, do what I do, just text Paul. It's fine. I'll just. Um, it's true. Although he does that less these days. Yeah, because I I know the rules now, and I, don't, I have less <laughs> arguments with people when they don't know the rules, and I'm having to like sit there and explain to them, listen to their side, and be like, okay, cool. Now, if you give me a chance to explain, I will understand. I'll, I'll let you know what's happening. And I actually had something like that happen with me uh, quite recently about replacement effects, and that was a really weird, interesting scenario that I was like, yep, okay, cool. I took your advice. Yep, okay, cool. But let me explain what's actually happening here. Uh, as if what you said was correct, but there is specific wording on these cards that need to be addressed before we can figure out what happens. And, uh, it was a good little discussion. Um, and yeah, it was having to do with like replacement effects and a dies effects and that then putting a replacement effect on there. And it was too much to get into right, right. This now is a quick little ranty segue, uh, anecdote thing. Um, but yeah, ninjutsu, really cool mechanic. Uh, I don't want to build a Yeriko deck because everyone has a Yeriko deck. So I want to find, try to find something that's different. And I don't really want to build Satoru Uizama either because everyone has that deck kind of built or at least broken to the point where it's just, it deals infinite everything. I want something new, fresh and fun to play with ninjutsu. So maybe just like a non-ninja commander that lets me ninj ninjutsu things in. I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'll get there. James, I'm going to need you to complete your statement. Uh, Yeah, okay. Are we going, like, I know you segued into the next one quite well, and I'm trying to think of a witty <laughs> way to get us through that, and I have no idea how to complete that. So with all that said and done, the last mechanic we have in this main phase one here is one that I thought would never, ever, 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 ever come back, but it did. And that is Phyrexian Manor. So we have, so far, only one card spoiled with Phyrexian Manor on it, and that is Tamiyo Completed Sage. So Tamiyo is now a Phyrexian. She's been completed. So she has a really weird casting cost. It's two green and hybrid Phyrexian for blue or a green, and then a blue mana. So Completed says uh, that the Phy the hybrid Phyrexian can be, paid can be paid with either a blue mana a green mana, or two life. If life was paid, this planeswalker enters the battlefield with two fewer loyalty counters. So she's five, comes out with five, or if you pay the, the three and the two life, she comes out with three. And she has three very relevant uh, activated abilities on her as well. I'm not going to read her exactly because we will get into the set review later on when season previous season is over and we have things to say about some of the cards. But uh, so far, 
I saw this card, and the first thing that pointed out to me was the fact that it's got Phyrexian Mana. And I thought Mark Rosewater said he would never print Phyrexian Mana ever again. Yeah, uh, he also said at one point that we'd never have dice rolling in, a, in an actual like Black Border Magic set. But yeah, that look, game D and D, you know. <laughs> I feel like this man just said something just to throw us off. Yeah, and times then, change, you know. Yeah, I'm, he's I'm, like, honestly, a little aside here. I'm really glad that he's actually willing to go back on some things and amend them because things are now more accepted, or you know. Whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm so down with dice rolling. I love that that D and D set with the, with the dice rolling. Um, Phyrexian Mana, I can get down with it again. Uh, it it does give a decent drawback in the fact that if you pay the two life to get it out two turns earlier or uh, one turn earlier, sorry, it does come in with fewer loyalty counters to try to get you to her ultimate, which uh, I believe makes things cost uh spells you cast cost two less to cast and you can tap that uh that artifact that it creates to draw a card the yes. thing that i i have mixed feelings about completed so first of all i actually am of the opinion that phyrexian man is actually okay um given that the cars that they are on are not you know format warping like gitaxian probe or uh whoa surgical extraction is like a little bit of a push but you really you know. thought like git probe is format warping oh that yeah i guess banned in a lot of places for yeah. good reason it's free yeah, information no, i get that <laughs> i mean two mana look at someone oh sorry not even two mana two life look at someone's hand draw a card yeah okay you can play four of them in, in normal formats but in as you can play one yeah no i understand very that. good uh very good for combo decks you get to see for free you get to check out the blue player science see if they have anything to stop your combo you know it's a powerful card. Don't tell him how I play Git Probe. That's exactly how I, I play Git Probe. I'm like, I'm going to combo off. I just say the blue player's hand. Let me just Git Probe you real quick. See what you got in your hand. Oh, no, right. no counter spells? Excellent. I will uh, proceed to then win the game. Perhaps one of the most egregious examples of all time is Mental Misstep. You know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, that aside, uh, it's good to see that they're now attaching so a, a downside to it. Although it's kind of weird that the mana symbol is attached to... A mechanic because if they print more completed cards in this set are they all gonna have like a paragraph of reminder text that tells you what the downside is because they're I not all gonna be so. planeswalkers i presume I, I no i don't know i don't think they'll have to uh print it either it's kind of like extort it's it is on everything but doesn't have to be because at a point we're gonna know exactly what extort does and it's the same with completed I think after a while, we will know what Completed does. Because, I mean, like, you still get, like, cards from core sets that have the reminder text of what flying does. Now, I understand that's for, like, newer, newer players. But then so is technically a standard set. It's for newer players, veteran players, and, you know, grinders to kind of get through. I think if we were to get cards um, that just said Completed on it and then had that was it just completed we would know what that meant um and is the downside going to be only on planeswalkers coming in with two less loyalty because you paid the extra because you paid the life what would be the downside on a creature if it etb it would be like you know it gets minus two minus two if it etb you know if you paid the the completed instead of paying the uh the actual amount of cost well the th okay so the thing is tamio's reminder text for completed specifically mentions that she comes in with less loyalty counters. Yeah. Right? So what I'm worried about is that every completed card is going to have that absolute just text wall, you know? Yeah. I feel like I, they probably could have simplified it to just say, if you paid life to cast this spell, do this instead, or, you know, something like that. I don't know. I, I have an issue with the templating, but it's it's kind of a minor thing, honestly. Um, and... It kind of implies to me, like James said, that maybe we only will have like one or two completed cards for that very reason. Yeah, I can't see us getting any more than one, considering this is like the first one we've we've seen ever. Um, I just, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know what the direction of what they're trying to do is. It's like I know, I have an idea of how I think it's gonna go, but I'm not sure if that's the direction that they're heading towards. So to see maybe multiple completed cards in this set may not happen. We might start seeing another completed card come up in another set, um, which we can talk about later on in this episode when we bring up the uh, in the main phase two, what we're going to talk about. Um, I don't want to talk about too much here. But with the, with the kind of current rate that we're seeing for Rexians, maybe we'll see one completed 
whenever. So who knows? Uh, I don't understand it exactly. Uh, I do like seeing Phyrexian Mana come back. I do like it seeing have a downside. Um, is it something going forward that would be really cool and fun to see in more and more sets? Yes, I do agree with that 100%. Uh, templating aside, Paul, I think this is a, a knockout mechanic. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, even if they only do like one or two cards, the fact that they're willing to test it again after how powerful and format warping it was the first time around yeah, is a really cool thing. And I really hope that they do more explorative things like this. Uh, and maybe I, revisit, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe buff Raid. Who knows? I could see that happening. I mean, Raid was raid was just kind of on, as long as a creature attacked, you got the Raid ability. So, I mean, yeah, that can see that kind of coming back. But with all of that, let's pass through to our combat phase, Paul, uh, and swing out with all of our creatures at you. Sure. Hmm. I want to make sure I have at least three lives so I can complete Tamiyo next turn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, choose your blocks because math is for blockers. We all know this. Uh, and with that, we're going to move through our combat phase now and we're going to hear a message from our sponsors right now. Welcome back from that ad break. We're going to get into our main phase two here and we're going to start talking about the keywords and themes of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty and our impressions of those keywords and themes. Uh, to start off here, Paul, we kind of talked about completed in the uh, in the main phase one and we're going to continue that talk, I guess, in main phase two here and start off with Phyrexians. This is Something we're seeing more and more of as the years go by. We saw it originally with Voron Klex Monstrous Raider in Kaldheim, who was maybe just as broken as his original printing of Voron Klex, the one that lets you tap for double and your opponent's lands that you uh, that they tap during their turns don't untap. Um, we're seeing a brand new one come in. Mono Blue Jinkataxis came out in this set. Um, yeah. Did you have anything you want to say about that exactly? Uh, about Jink attacks just specifically or about the presence of Phyrexians? About the presence of Phyrexians. Um, I think it's really cool to see them popping up in different places. Like it kind of suggests like after, did Phyrexia get blowed up? Is that what happened? I can't, I can't really remember. I wasn't, I'm not really that into lore, so. I know Mirrodin got like dissolved again, like covered in oil, which then turns it into new Phyrexia. And I'm not sure exactly what happened there i like paul am not 100 percent versed in the lore of magic it wasn't something that i really picked up on because i was too busy learning the lore of world of warcraft <laughs> uh, which i know backwards forwards upside down left right you know reading little bits here little bits there i can complete the story myself um so it's something that i'm interested in going back and looking up and 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 reading and everything something about the hell vault as well in dark ascension had to do with new phyrexia and, and something or something i may be very very wrong and please please feel free if you're listening to this blow us up on twitter about it blow us up and tell us how bad we are with the law that is totally fine i will love react every single tweet that we get that says that we're really bad with the law um uh well all that aside anyway it's really cool to see uh, I guess are are they really villains? I I don't know, but it's it's cool to see that like for like these creatures from this plane, these these like I guess they are like considered royalty or something like that, and uh by fractions, it's cool to see them pop up in very different places. Like you said, like uh uh the green one. What I'm Vornklex. Vornklex. Thank you. Uh, he showed You're up welcome. on Kaldheim, which is very different from the uh, the futuristic Kamigawa. Like, who are we gonna see next? Like, what if we see Elish Norn and Alara? Right? Like, the the possibilities are endless. Uh, given well, what was, we already know, there was a theory going around when Strixhaven was being spoiled that we would see Elish Norn be like the secret headmaster of. Or like the one pulling the strings in the background of Strixhaven, but that turned out not to be true. Um, and I will say, Voronklex almost died on uh, on Kaldheim if El uh, Elrond didn't interfere with Kaya and you know uh, let Kaya kind of you know vanquish him by stabbing him in the face. But anyway. Little tidbit aside, Voronklex should be dead, but he kind of just disappeared. He he, he went into a portal. 
and disappeared and we haven't seen him since. So we don't know where Voronklex is currently, even though he popped up on Caldheim. Uh, Jinkataxis, no, ex no idea exactly what his story arc is going to be on this plane. This isn't a lore episode. Um, as more and more I'm talking about it, maybe we should be doing a lore episode at sometime soon because that'd be really cool. But any rate, seeing the Phyrexians in more and more sets going forward and so far once a year, I have a feeling, and this is me putting on my tinfoil hat and my theorist hat at the moment and thinking that we're going to get one new uh, Phyrexian every year for the next three years because we just got, you know, Voronklex, we're getting Jinkataxis this year. Next year we'll either get uh, Elish Norn, Urbrask, or Shieldred. I couldn't think of the last one there. Shieldred. And then maybe after that, we'll see some sort of like Phyrexian uprise, which then we will then have to quell. And that might lead into something else, which then, you know, allows the, the rebuilding of new Phyrexia. And we start seeing more and more Phyrexians come up. And then we have this new Phyrexian threat we have to go and fight. Yeah. And eventually That'd we'll have some new War of the Spark, Spore of the Spark type set, you know, where instead of Nicol Bolas, it's the Praetors. And instead of... Or maybe even a Traxa, who knows? Maybe we'll see a Traxa in the main set. Ooh. That'd be sick. I would be totally down for that. I'd be like, at the end of the day, she's like the one that sits above all the other Praetors and all the other, uh, yeah, all the other Praetors. And she's like the head of the Praetor Council kind of thing. And she's like, hey, look at me. I am, I'm a Traxa. I'm five colors. <laughs> Run at me. Look. I have all, I have all four of the best colors for the best Praetors. Uh, in magic, because let's be honest, Urbrask is a little lacking at the moment. I'm glad you mentioned that because my closing point on this is going to be I love that the Phyrexians are coming back. Just, Watsy, please do our boy Urbrask right this time. All right? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it's like five mana for all cre uh, like creatures you control get haste and your opponent's creatures enter the battlefield tapped. Yeah. And it's a 4-4. Four, like, four. it's a four mana, it's a five mana 4-4. Four, four. Okay, cool. Like, that's not that great. Like, let's, let's make this something really good this time, uh, Watsy. Let, I know, I know we can do it. Look what we've already got. And let's, let, let's, you know, let's, let, let's hit a home run with this one, shall we? <laughs> Moving on, Paul, we have a new keyword to talk about here, and that is modified. So you want to just quickly explain what modified is to our listeners? Yeah, so... A modified creature or modifications thereof is any creature that has an equipment attached to it, an aura, which is a type of enchantment, or a, I think any counter, not just plus one, plus one counters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe it's just plus one, plus one, but I will quickly bring that up. All right. Well, in the meantime, uh, this is something that like has kind of existed in various forms over time uh but this is the first time we're getting like a word for it i know in the original uh like in the original zendikar set i think there were creatures that like did certain things if they were equipped like they got double strike or something uh but now we're getting being enchanted being equipped being changed at all from your original base card into one succinct word and i actually realized that that doesn't even account for like being mutated because this doesn't actually count mutated nope. that doesn't make any sense at all to me but whatever uh well because it's it's it, it's polymerizationing or it's fusing two creatures together is what mutating is it's not modified which is a big big difference there paul but, i don't know i feel like if you're slapping a bear onto a monkey that's a modification yeah but you're not like you're not <laughs> equipping the bear with the monkey you're like well fusing actually you together. are in kamigawa well, I mean, yes, in Kamigawa, you are completely. You are reconfiguring a monkey to be on a bear's shoulders. But in Ikoria, you were kind of like fusing them together. And Full Metal Alchemist just popped into my head for many, many reasons. But anyway, you're kind of fusing a monkey with a bear together in that set. So it's a little, it is a little different. I can see the distinguish between the two. Um, but modified... Like the word modified creatures actually started on a playtest card that came up in the Mystery Boosters convention set. Um, it was Luvac the Aberrant. It says protection from modified creatures. Modified creatures have a power, toughness, power, toughness, or ability different than their printed versions. And the way that it's worded in, like the way that it's actually worded in, in, in Magic now is, you are correct, um, 
it is a, a, a it refers to a creature that is equipped enchanted by the creature's controller with an aura or have counters on them so it is not just plus and plus one counters like i thought it was yeah because i noticed there's actually there's a card in the set that actually comes into play with a death touch counter it's an injutsu card i think yeah which then it would make that that creature's then a modified creature and then there are there are spells in the set that looks at the amount of modified creatures you have at the time of resolution of the spell so it's it says like for x mana i can't remember what mana cost it is it deals three damage but it will deal more damage if you have a modified creature which means if you cast the spell and someone then removes your modified creature it will only deal the the base amount because it won't see you having a modified creature at the time that the spell resolves yeah i know what spell you're talking about it's a it's a black spell i think but um Oh, here. It's called Lethal Exploit. It's one and a black. It's instant. Target creature gets minus two, minus two till on the turn. Gets an additional minus one, minus one until on a turn for each modified creature you controlled as you cast the spell, not actually on resolution. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that one's, yeah, that one is. There was a red spell that I was looking at that was a burn spell. Oh, okay. That dealt more That dealt more damage if you had a uh, a modified creature. And it may be templated and worded the same way that I might have just been misremembering it. Because I'm I'm doing this off the top of my head. It is. I'm looking at it right now. It's called Discharger Fire. Okay. <laughs> then disregard everything I just said. <laughs> I'm gonna take it out and it's it's it never happened. It never not happened. Um with that we have another really cool theme that's coming back in a heavy, heavy way in commander, and that is vehicles. So vehicles is a really cool mechanic from uh, Kaladesh, I believe it was first printed in. Uh, vehicles, yeah, they debuted in Kaladesh uh, with the infamous, uh, what was that train? I forgot. It was like a, it was a four three that like got plus one plus one when you attacked with it at Trample. It was ridiculous and limited. I wasn't playing Magic around those times, so I do not know what that card was. Uh, well, I wasn't playing Standard around those times, I should say. Well, I mean, it wasn't Standard played either. It was just ridiculous and limited. Fair. <laughs> it was a literal train. <laughs> It's a literal train. Yeah, we're getting a. Uh, I'm pretty sure this has been has been previewed now, but we're getting the two new commander decks. One of them is a snake samurai, and the other one is a moon folk pilot. And it's going to deal with vehicles. So we are getting vehicles. We're getting a lot of vehicle support coming in in commander with uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, and I am definitely here for it. As someone who played vehicles quite heavily in the Kalamax, uh deck which was taking calamax to the max trying to get as many vehicles in there as possible that i can crew with calamax perfect way to get him tapped and another perfect way of getting things through uh through damage wise being able to turn calamax's power into something else and then swing with that awesome gets calamax tapped hell yeah uh and then we're seeing like i said one of the commander decks is a i believe it's azorius it's a pilot and it can crew anything as though that that vehicle had power two or something or like crew two yeah that's actually uh another slight theme in here is that you have some creatures that like tap creatures as though they had more power than they actually do yeah and it's really i mean they've really pushed hard into making vehicles better than what they were and i say that quite lightly because i mean like vehicles are pretty strong back in the day like there was the the two mana one. It was really just Smuggler's would, Copter. Smuggler's Copter. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, it's it's, it's the two mana two two that crews one. It has crew three, three. one. Two mana three three. Car, oh, the two car mana is ridiculous. Three, three. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, would, that would never get printed these days. Who authorized that? I have to get Watsy on the phone now. Uh, all right. Outside of vehicles, back on the ground. Give me some swords. We've got some samurai to talk about, Paul. Yeah. I, I love samurais. They are, like I said, I love everything Japanese themed. I love ninjas. I love samurais. I've always had this thing for samurai swords and now getting able to build a samurai tribal deck because of Neo, uh, because of Kamigawa and Neon Dynasty. I am so here for it. So uh, watch this space for a samurai tribal theme deck coming soon to a YouTube channel near you. Yeah, I... Uh... I don't want to talk too much about Samurai because it's it's Kamigawa. Like, we kind of knew that Samurai were going to happen. Um, one thing I will say is that they've changed them up a little bit. Um, they now do stuff when they attack alone. Um, various cards have things that happen when things attack alone. Kind of reminds me of Exalted back from Alara. Um, but yeah, that is their new like mechanic, I suppose, is attacking alone. 
Yeah, they got rid of the Bushido mechanic and Thank was God. like, here, don't worry about Bushido. <laughs> no one's going to remember that. Like, if I if I say to a new player, I was like, hey, do you remember Samurai's had Bushido? And they would look at me like i got three heads. But if I said, hey, if if did you know that Samurai's now when they attack alone, they get stuff? Like, that? that's pretty cool. Because it's like that lone Samurai kind of thing. So maybe Samurai Tribal's not the best. Maybe Samurai Voltron, question mark? Because you can just have that one thing attack alone by itself all the time. Just like swing, swing. Kind of reminds me of like Yojimbo from Final Fantasy X. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you just well, pay him a bunch of money until he uses... Uh, crap, I forgot the name of his really good attack. The one-shot kill one. Ah, whatever. Oh my god. Th- this isn't a Final Fantasy uh, podcast. It's not. I-, I do know the ability you're talking about. I. It's like Zen Mato or something. Yes, that's it. Zen Mato. Yes. <laughs> that's it. There you go. Got there in the end. I always get there in the end, Paul. You know this. No matter what it is, I always get there in the end. Uh, Samurais, yeah. Lots and lots of Samurais in this set, and I am definitely here for it. Will I be picking up the Snake Samurai Precon? Most likely, because it is a Snake Samurai, and that is just some cool shit right there, and I'm here for it. Uh, and then lastly, Paul, here before we get out for the week, uh, we have Sagas. Sagas are coming back, everybody. I, you may have seen them on the previews. Uh, I love sagas. They kind of feel that nichey, like, oh, you get to do, do these things once every turn for three turns and then off they go. But there is a massive difference between the original sagas and these sagas. As now, you'll see some of the sagas have the ability to flip. So they'll do their original, they'll come in with one law counter at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you'll put an, an additional law counter on it, you'll do that effect. The next turn you'll do the same thing, and then after it gets its third one and it's done its third thing, it will then exile itself and then return flipped, and it is usually always an enchantment creature that it flips into. Uh, it Right now it is always an enchantment creature. Um, I like... So I, I'm pretty sure the reason why they did this is because I was telling just the James before we started recording is that uh, I think this is their homage or their reference, their honorary uh, flip back? creatures from the original Kamigawa set, uh, which if you remember, there were cards that you literally had to turn upside down once you fulfilled certain conditions. It was a nightmare. They looked awful. It was not good. Um, and they didn't I, have enough text on them. Yeah, it was it was not pretty. Um, but I think this is how they are make, bringing them back, basically. And I really like this because, like James said, sagas were a one time thing, right? They would do their thing, they go to the graveyard, and then you know, obladi obada, life goes on. Um, but now you actually get like a little bit of a bonus out of it, and like. Yeah, the creatures aren't that amazing. I think the best one so far is like the five color, like Okagachi one. But it's it's something more than they used to have. Uh, I, I think Azusa, like the flip side is it gets it's a zero zero that gets it's as big as the lands you control. Yeah, uh, that one's really cool. <laughs> I, I do like that one a lot. That one is pretty cool. Uh, I already mentioned Okagachi. Uh, there's the the really the coolest one I've seen so far is the Kiki Jiki one, which I think may have actually just been spoiled today, maybe yesterday. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that one. No, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I haven't been like it hasn't been on the top of my priority list to uh, to jump straight onto magic spoilers or mythic spoilers or wherever you get your spoilers from, and actually like read through all of them. I have been. Uh, but I haven't made it like my religion to make sure that I'm always checking the mythic spoilers as soon as I wake up every morning. I probably should be like, not, not going to lie. Yeah. Like honestly, the, the enchantment, the saga itself is actually like pretty good. Uh, it's first chapter is you make a two, two goblin shaman that whenever it attacks, you get a treasure. Um, that's not a one-time thing, by the way, if you keep it alive, you get more treasures. Uh, chapter two, you discard, you get to discard up to two cards and you draw that many. And then the creature on the other side is a 2-2 that literally has Kiki Jiki's ability. It's one tap, make a token that's a copy of a non-legendary creature you control, give it haste, and sack it at the beginning of the next next step. Now, Kiki Jiki's ability didn't have mana attached to it, did it? It just needed a tap, right? No, but this is a 3-drop as opposed to a 5-drop for triple red, so... Yeah, this has been mana-gated hard, but still not a bad thing. Yeah, create a token that's a copy of another target non-legendary creature you control, except that has haste, sacrifice at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, that's an easy way to get like a Kiki Jiki effect in, in your, uh, in your deck if you don't want to pay for Kiki Jiki. I love it. 
It's fantastic. Yeah, not to mention that it can it can fuel graveyard shenanigans because it lets you discard cards. Like this is actually playable in Alesha. Um, you can populate that two two goblin that makes treasures with Girid. Uh, yeah. Okay, I just found a real another really cool one here. I don't know. This isn't our set review episode, but tribute to Harobi is really cool. When you flip it into its creature side, it is a three three with flying and haste. It says when Echo of Death's Wail enters the battlefield, gain control of all rat tokens. Whenever Echo of Death's Wail attacks, you may sacrifice another creature if you do draw a card. Yeah, that's uh, wow. I didn't, I haven't seen that one either. But that's also it's uh it's a it's one in a black. You actually for the first two sagas, uh, sorry for the first two law counters, you give your opponents uh, a one one black rat creature token, rat rogue creature token, and then after the third turn you exile it, and when you exile and bring it back, you gain control of all those rats. So you're like, here, I'm going to give you guys some rats, and then if you don't use them, or use them as block fodder or attacking fodder or whatever or sack fodder, I'm going to grab them all. They're going to be mine. Yeah, and that happens. Uh... That's each opponent, and it happens twice. So in a game of commander, yeah. you're, you know, optimistically, if your opponents don't conspire against you, getting six rat tokens, which would be sweet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, even dude. if you just get the other side, it's a sack outlet that also draws cards for your trouble. Yeah. Pretty good. And it doesn't say sacrifice another rat. It just says sacrifice another creature. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows where that's going to go? Uh, I, I think I have a couple decks that that might go in because I want to give my opponents creatures. It may even go in my Taste of Karlov deck. I think Moldrotha decks I give will my... play this pretty comfortably. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in, in Taser, I want to give my opponents creatures to then have them sacrifice them. And then when they die, I'm going to drain them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, and with that, that is all of the mechanics and keywords slash themes that we have seen in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty as so far. So we're going to go through our end step here. And if you want to continue the conversation with us, if you want to talk to us about anything, you can do it on our Instagram or our Twitter at CMDR at arms. Uh, if you want to check out all of our deck techs and all of our other videos, our stream VODs, they will go up on our YouTube channel, which is... Uh, youtube.com slash commander at arms go and check that out like subscribe uh hit the notification bell don't forget to leave a comment below if you want to check out our, our weekly streams with your favorite content creators you can do that on twitch.tv slash commander at arms if you want to buy sealed products as well as singles anything from neon uh anything from kamigawa neon dynasty for a matter of fact uh and get it shipped to your house fast easy and give us a small kickback with that. You can do it through tcgplayer.com slash commander at arms. If you want to wrap a commander at arms logo across your chest on our favorite piece of merch ever, you can do that in the link below. It will take you to the Bad Fred Design Co. Etsy page who hosts all of our shirts. Go and check that shop out. It's got some really sick stuff on there as well as, like I said, our commander at arms merch. Uh, if you want to support the show directly through any other means, you can do that through patreon.com slash commander at arms. There's three tiers in there. All tiers get access to our discord server. And who knows, you may be able to play magic with Paul or I. Uh, and with that, Paul, do you have anything else you want to say? Of course. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening to this week's episode. I hope you all, by the time you listen to this, have tuned into our stream as well. Um, regardless, no matter what you tune into, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to or watch whatever you did. Uh, me and James take a lot of time to, uh, sit down, record this, think about our topics, think about our talking points. And, you know, even if you just listen for a few minutes, it's still something, it's time that you could have spent doing anything else. Uh, so thank you for doing that. If you happen to enjoy what you just heard and or watched, uh, feel free to share our name around with your friends or with your play group. You know, say, hey, I just listened to Paul and James, uh, these really cool guys. They talked about uh, Kamigawa. They brought up a couple interesting points about, you know, like completed and channel that I didn't think about before. And I think you might be, uh, I think you might like it. Uh, the more people that know about us, the more people we get to talk to. And me and James always say that the best part about being part of this community is how many people there are, how many different opinions get expressed to you, you know, even on like a daily basis, let alone a weekly basis or a monthly basis. So thank you for spreading our name around and thank you for listening. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, 
Uh, don't forget to leave us a five-star review and also leave us a, a, a message on there as well. Definitely helps to get our name out there through those, uh, those platforms. Uh, and with all that, I'm James. And I'm Paul. And you've been listening to the newest episode of the Commander at Arms podcast. And remember, arm yourself with knowledge. Peace. See ya.